Hello and welcome to Holston Church this morning. I'm glad that you've tuned in. We've uh, had to cancel our in-person service, but we're thankful that we've had the opportunity to use technology in this way. That we can bring you a lesson that we believe will be encouraging and edifying for you through this week. And again, as we do each week, we want to remind ourselves of the four foundational principles for our fellowship. First, being the sovereignty of God. Second, being a non-literal approach to understanding scripture. Thirdly, a preterist outlook, which we mean by that an optimistic outlook of the future. And fourthly, we always want to encourage you to think through and study everything that we may offer or anyone else. We encourage a thinking faith. Don't just take something at face value, but we encourage you, please study. Do consider what we present, but do it with a, a very discerning heart and mind. Of course, one reason why we're not having our in-person service this week is because there are several people who have a positive COVID diagnosis. So we want to remember them this week, several that are in the hospital or that are recovering. And we do know of some in our other fellowships that are having to care for those that are in hospice and their families. So please remember them this week in your thoughts and your prayers. Uh, and court, obviously we want you to um, uh, let us know if there's a need or we're uh, not maybe aware of something uh, in your own life. Uh, we also want to remind you of our upcoming spring conference. We're getting more people talking to us about coming and being with us. So we're very excited about that. We want you to be thinking about that. And as always, uh, be praying and, and uh, have our thoughts uh, toward being a fruitful time of fellowship and of learning. Just as a reminder, our spring conference, Rethinking the Resurrection, will be March 26th and March 27th. The morning session of March 26th will be at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll have Brother Daniel Rogers and Brother Scott Laughlin speaking that morning. We'll also have Q&A sessions for each of the, uh, each of the planned uh, sessions for each day. The 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, session the same day on March 26th of that evening, we'll have Michael Miano with us from the Blue Point Bible Church. We'll also have Elder Reese Maggard will be speaking that evening. Then the next day, Sunday, March 27th at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, we'll be glad to have Brother Alvin Dixon from North Carolina. He's a pastor of Mount Carmel Union Baptist Church, and I'll also be speaking that morning. So. Uh, we'd ask you to just remember us that this will be a fruitful time of fellowship and of learning. We're very thankful for the sessions that Mike Cornett has brought us for our current study about the seven feasts of the Lord with weather constraints and with some of the sickness and cancellation of services. I know uh, it's been rather tough to be able to get these in a cohesive manner. Uh, but I'm thankful, though, that we've been able to record many of these sessions and, and make them available. Mike's done a tremendous job. He's spent a lot of time and energy studying through this, and it's a real passion of his. So we're glad to have had the opportunity to do this. And it's it's been really in, in, enlightening and helpful to see uh, how each of these feasts represent a fulfillment that we find in the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll be able to get the end of this study next time Mike is with us. Hopefully it'll be next Sunday and we can look through the Feast of Booze and we're very excited about that. I'm very excited about this lesson today. I think it's going to be really helpful. It sets a framework for our understanding going forward where we're going to do some in-depth verse-by-verse studies uh, on out into the year. But I want to get the framework right so we can see why that we have this foundation, uh, why this framework makes sense. And that way you can see how we would approach each of the letters of Paul, each of the Gospels, and especially the Hebrew scriptures that we find in the Old Testament. So this is all interrelated. But we want 
to look at this today and hope that this will be a helpful guide for you going forward. All right, so here it is. The title of this series I want to look at is From a Death Cult to a Living Faith, or How Do We Move Forward from Fear and Embrace Life? It seems like we're in this trap of always thinking that it's the end of the world. It's the chicken little doctrine, that the sky is falling. Every other day, it seems like whether it's politics or, or religion or in economics, in all these fields, you know, you've got these people that uh, it's always the end of the world is coming, but especially in religious circles, it seems like people just get uh, absolutely excited about the fact that uh, the end of the world is somehow just right around the corner. And every generation believes that they're the last generation because obviously why wouldn't it be? Because they're the most special generation. So, you know, it's this same thing we hear over and over for hundreds and thousands of years now that the world is coming to an end, that doom and gloom is upon us. And we wonder, why is it? Why, why is it that so many believe that life itself is something to just overcome so you can finally get to death and get to the other world that you can really be happy. And I don't think people intentionally, consciously think in terms of that, but it's the implications of what they teach because what they teach is this world is not my home. I'm just a pilgrim that's struggling through. So it's always these songs that, that encourage people to not like their life. They're encouraging them to constantly look for God to finally come and destroy the world. It's, it's, it's really interesting to see, you know, why is it that we always prefer bad news to good news? No matter how much you try to present good news, no matter how you get people fired up for feeling confident and optimistic, there's just something in our nature that will not let us embrace the fact that there is an open, beautiful future and there's a beautiful life that we have in front of us. We don't have to just, just try to struggle through this world to finally get the eternal retirement somewhere out in the future after we've let go of the bonds of these earthly shackles. Uh, so we want to examine that today. We want to look forward and see what are some of the ways in which that many of us either have or do live in sort of a death cult religion and how can we move forward to a living, vibrant faith. In order to bring some clarity to these questions, we want to look at why do people believe we're living in the last days? What did the early church actually believe? And what is the new covenant? These three questions should help bring some clarity on the issue. Why is it that people believe we're living in the last days? They've said this time and time again. Uh, so we want to look at this first at the negativity bias, second at historical ignorance, and thirdly at literal interpretations. It doesn't matter if you watch Fox News, if you watch CNN, MSNBC, uh, Drudge Report, whatever news that you get, even the BBC World Service or whatever that you can find in the news business, 95% of news headlines are bad news. Why is that? Why? Why? And, and you hear people say this a lot of times, like, why can't we hear some good news? Why can't there be something presented? Well, sometimes they do. Sometimes you see uh, news organizations put out really good feeling uh, uh, headlines or, they, or they, they'll have uh, uh, certain reports or pieces that show people that are out making a difference in the world and actually making the world better. But it seems like we're overcome constantly by the bad news. So why is that? Well, there is what's called the negativity bias. The negativity bias is a cognitive bias 
that results in adverse events having a more significant impact on our psychological state than positive events. We're just geared that way. We're, we're organically and biologically made uh, that where we sense uh, negativity in much more of a stronger sense than we ever will positive events. A negativity bias occurs even when adverse events and positive events are of the same magnitude, meaning we feel negative events more intensely. So a lot of this, of course, is biologically driven because we are biologically made where we feel negative things in such more of a magnitude. And, and we'll look at that as, as to why there is a, a biological trigger in our brain that keeps us dwelling on the negative. I'm sure you've noticed in your own life that criticisms often have a greater impact than compliments and bad news draws uh, more attention than good. So a lot of times you can have people that compliment you and encourage you and tell you all these wonderful things, help to build you up. But then one person can come along and say something negative and you just dwell on that and it just eats at you and you can't figure out, you know, why am I letting this person get to me? This isn't even really a good person. And, and we can know that we can tell you that we can say, well, you know, in our mind, we'll say, this is a rotten person that's told me that I'm not a good person or that's been critical of something that I've done or, or maybe a facial feature or, or maybe what I did didn't seem like it was good enough. Uh, you, you see this a lot of times on, on Twitter and Facebook and lots of different social media outlets is that you can have compliment after compliment, love and, and grace and, and all these positive uh, aspects given. And then you'll have one person say, oh, I don't think they're that great. And, and it just seems like it destroys us. Well, the reason for this is that negative events, again, like we've said, have a greater impact on our brains than the positive ones. Cortisol is a chemical in our brain that tends to flow more freely and spurs negative thoughts. So your brain loves cortisol. These experiences are common and trigger cortisol in your brain with a snap, which means that negative thoughts become more easily, they'll, they'll, they'll come more easily than positive thoughts. So cortisol is something that your brain, uh, it, it loves and it, and it flows more freely. So that's why we think, oh, these negative thoughts, why, why am I? and you think you're a bad person. You know, you think you're a horrible person because you have these uh, uh, negative thoughts or, or you're dwelling on them so much. But honestly, this is a natural part of being a human being. But the first step toward doing something about it is, of course, to have clarity and recognize this about us, to know that you're not a horrible person. You're actually a, a normal person. So I know that's shocking to some of you, but it's, it's okay. It's okay. But it, it is something that we can deal with. For just a minute too, we'll look at just the fact that there is a lot of ignorance of history. Uh, Franklin Jones once said, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. Because how many times have we been told, now we didn't have that back in my day. Now, now back in my day, we respected people or you know, they always act like there's so everything is so much better in the past. It doesn't matter if it's religious people or politicians. They're always looking to the past and saying there was this golden era one time and somehow somebody came in and spoiled it. And if we could just enact certain religious fervors or if you just if you would just act right, <laughs> you know, or if you would just conform to the church's uh, norms or what they tell you that you should do and, and act and behave correctly, or if you'll just elect the right politicians, that somehow we'll get back to that golden era. But it's, it's really an ignorance of history, and they're hoping that you stay ignorant of history. But we look time and again that the past is filled with a lot of things we wouldn't want today. Just looking at a few simple things like Black Death killed half of Europe in the 14th century, half of Europe, not just a few people, not just 100,000. It Black Death itself killed half the population. They thought in their day this was the end of the world. 
They thought God is mad and he's brought about black death and, and, and they had people just dying left and right on the streets and people just carrying out dead bodies. I mean, just it's horrible. Um, in, in, in 1820, 90% of the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Uh, that meant that, of course, everybody was poor, no matter who they were. So you had a, just a handful of rich elite aristocrats who actually were in charge, who were educated, or that knew what was going on in the world, and everybody else was just in survival mode. So you couldn't think about art, literature, poetry, uh, anything else. I mean, you, you, you basically were fighting off hoping that there were disease wouldn't kill all your children. Uh, families were large, but they had to be large because most of the time, the, the majority of the children would die in infancy or would not reach the age of 10 because of childhood diseases. Not to mention the fact that there was slavery, women had no rights or voice, and, and like we mentioned, only aristocratic elites were educated, you know, so it, it was it's, it was an odd thing to bring in public education or uh, like the Puritan system where they taught all of the families and children to be readers and writers and, and to have this certain kind of uh, just minimal educational level and that wasn't even thought of. And, and not to mention, I could, I could go on and on about surgical techniques, about how the vast majority of people, if you got a scratch or if you were out in the middle of a battlefield fighting, you know, you were going to come back and you weren't going to have all your limbs because they were going to get sawed off. That's all they knew to do. If you were injured in battle, there wasn't a treatment for that specific area other than just saw off your arm or your leg. So it doesn't sound like the good old days. Really, when you look at history and you see all the corruption, all the disease, and all the ignorance of diseases, because there were people that were trying to cast magical spells to keep disease away from you because they didn't understand what bacteria was. I mean, there's just, I could just go on and on with an endless list of reasons why the last hundred or so years are such a step forward for progress in humanity. You know, there are, there are several nations now that have democratic institutions that would have been unheard of in times past. So it's, there's, there's it, and, and what's funny is uh, there's books and there's people uh, that advocate for the fact that, that times have gotten better, but because of negativity bias, People aren't willing to hear it, no matter of their intelligence level, no matter uh, what position they're in as far as they could be on the far right or the far left of the political spectrum. Nobody wants to hear good news <laughs> because again, they they want to they 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 love the bad news. The bad news is a bad news is a way to help to get people to move forward and to get things done but it's not the best way to do it because again this is how it's been used for centuries so there is a grand ignorance of history and and a grand ignorance of the past in such a way that we want to ignore one scholar even calls it uh one of the greatest aspects of of humanity is their propensity toward amnesia so, so they could just forget everything that went before and just uh, think that uh, we're in the worst part of history, that we think that our current political leaders are the only ones that's ever been corrupt. Or we think that our situation is the worst because we're in it and we're, I, I guess, that special. So uh, a, a real ignorance of history can leave you thinking that of course you're in the worst time that you could have ever lived when you can have whatever you, you can have the past all you want. Uh, I would rather live in a time where polio is, uh, is eradicated. Smallpox is eradicated. Children aren't dying left and right because of simple uh, diseases that could be easily cured in our day. 
And it's nice having the fact that more people have rights and have a voice. And it may be something that irritates lots of people that don't want to hear it. But at least people can have their voice heard. And, you know, we have technology. There's so many things that have caused us to be uh, excited about the, the era and the time we live in. But because of negativity bias and because we have a propensity toward negativity, we can't really celebrate because, of course, we're living in the worst times. Of course, we'll look at this. This is one of the biggest issues is literal interpretations of Scripture. And it's not like there's any shortage of this. Even in the days of the Jewish wars, after Jesus' death and resurrection, after the ministry of Paul and the apostles, uh, we can look at the first century itself. And there was a Jewish Essene sect of ascetics that saw the Jewish uprising against the Romans around 66 to 70 AD. I know we talk about that a lot of times about the destruction of Jerusalem, especially the temple. But lots of Jewish sects at that time saw this as a literal end uh, of the world. And uh, it's what they, they thought it was the prediction. That's why there were lots of different Messiah figures around the time of Jesus. There were lots of different militia groups that were forming to bring in the end. And this would bring in the arrival of, of the true Messiah of Israel is what this is how they interpreted it. And they interpreted it to a point where by the authority of Simon, coins were minted declaring the redemption of Israel because of these literal interpretations of prophecy. And there have been several attempts to predict the end of the world in history ever since that time. And it always ends well, it starts and ends in the same way. You have this fervor toward an end of the world. They point to scriptures that on literal uh, interpretive frameworks seem to say that it's near. Time is near and it's going to happen just any minute that God is going to break into history. He's going to kick butt and the children of light is going to fight with the enemies of God out here. And it's going to be this huge Armageddon. And, and you know, so there's lots of people who have interpreted this uh, as literally taking place, that the stars will literally, literally shake, that the sun will become dark and the moon will literally become blood. Uh, you know, so there, there's no end to it. And we'll just look, take a short look at this because I mean, it, it would take hours and hours to look at all the various interpretations throughout history. I've already mentioned the, uh, the Simon uh, and the Jewish Essenes in 66 and 70 AD, but they're not the only ones to look at this. Lots of early uh, groups, and we'll look at that Next time that we have our lesson in part two, we'll look at what the early church believed. And there's a lot of differences there. There were literal interpretations, but there were also lots of metaphorical and allegorical interpretations. But we can see just the first millennium alone, there were lots of different people interpreting the end of the, the, end of the world. The end of time was coming. Uh, they're all saying the same thing, that by a certain time, uh, Jesus had to come back. And uh, you have somebody, I mean, just look at uh, Hippolytus of Rome in 500, 500 AD, uh, predicted that Jesus would return that year and that those predictions were based on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Uh, you have some, uh, one was a Spanish monk in 793, predicted the second coming and, uh, you know, got a large crowd stirred up. Uh, there was uh, predictions at 800, 7 to 800 with Gregory as a French bishop. He calculated the end of the world would occur between 799 and 806. We see these over and over. And, and you could see maybe the first thousand years of uh, Christian history that, you know, you got closer to the year 1000. There might be some truth to some of that if you're taking these scriptures literally. 
and Pope Sylvester II and others, according to lots of different sources, predicted that uh, this is the millennium that was spoken of. Uh, you know, and because of that, there were riots, there were all sorts of issues that were going on in the culture. And, uh, you know, if you want to dive deep into that, you can. But again, this is just the first thousand years, and this is just a very short list. They're, the list could just go on and on. Well, after, after Jesus didn't come back in the first millennium, then you have lots of others, and you can see over and over uh, predictions, 12 to 1260. Uh, you see, uh, you know, because of the rise of Islam, uh, Pope Innocent, you know, it didn't matter who they were or what level of education or intelligence, they would just predict over and over the same thing. The end is coming, the signs of the end, the signs of the time. I'm sure you've never heard any of that, you know, so uh, just this is just another short list just from the uh, 11th to the 15th centuries. As we get closer to the Protestant Reformation, we see this same trend, this same uh, literalizing of these texts and seeing some sort of end of the world. So you, again, you've got uh, people predicting uh, over and over the same type of predictions. Uh, some were Anabaptists, some were Lutherans, some were in the Reformed camp. Even Martin Luther himself, Mr. Reformation, uh, you know, he was uh, the responsible for, in a large part for the German Reformation, for the Protestant Reformation in general, but especially in Germany, predicted that the end of the world would occur no later than 1600. So no one's immune from this type of thing if you look at these scriptures in a literal fashion. The pattern just keeps going over and over again. You have predictions, you have them not coming true, uh, and the world keeps going. Even with all the disease and all the horrible things that are happening, uh, people think, well, it didn't happen then. Well, it's going to happen. You know, and, and I don't want to just belabor this point, but just going over and over, this, the list gets longer. As, as it gets closer to the 20th and 21st centuries, the list goes on and on. You can even see Cotton Mather, one of the uh, stalwarts of the Puritan movement here in early America, predicted that, um, you know, on two different times, two different occasions, uh, about the end of the world. So it didn't matter if it was Calvinists, Anglicans, whoever it was, they were approaching these scriptures uh, over and over with the same sort of eyes. There was uh, people because of the bubonic plague, because of the great fire of London. You know, again, I don't want to go into every detail and all this. You can, if you want time to do this, there's, there's volumes of books out there that examine this sort of apocalypticism where people just continually look for the same end to come, but never happens. Here we have the 18th century. Uh, we've got, again, people over and over, the same predictions, uh, you know, whether here's a comet, uh, William Whiston, who's a theologian that predicted a comet colliding with the earth that year. Um, uh, just so many, it, it just becomes overwhelming after a while when you look at the data of the number of people that have looked for the end of the world. Going into the 19th century, you see more of the same. John Wesley, one of the founders of the Methodist Church, foresaw the millennium beginning that year. This was in, uh, of course, the 1800s. Uh, and he interpreted, and he wrote in his commentary, Revelation 12, 14, referred to 1058 to 1836, and this would be the beginning of the millennium. So, Please really reconsider the ideas of interpreting literal, pass, you know, interpreting these passages in a literal way. It's been tried. It's been tried over and over, but people don't learn from the past. A lot of times because they don't know, because they're ignorant of it. They don't know that there are all these people over and over, and even people that we can look back at and admire. People you've probably quoted 
I, I can't count the number of John Wesley quotes that are good quotes. And John Wesley, I'm not saying anything bad about it. He's a good, uh, fine person, good moral, uh, and, and a great preacher from all accounts. But it's easy to fall victim to this in literalism. And I know you're getting tired. So that's why with 20th century predictions, it would take 20 more slides to show you everything that was predicted about the end of the world because we had this fervor of uh, you know, John Darby started uh, the whole dispensationalist framework and then you had Schofield with his Bible and the notes in his Bible that were circulated and because of this it was causing just an explosive amount of people that were interested in dispensationalism and uh, end of the world theology and if you look at lots of scriptures in the New Testament they seem to point toward the end and urgency and so this led to revival fervor we've got to get people saved we've got to convert people we've got to go out and get the news so this led to missionary movements this led to so many of the divisions within denominations that took place between those that literally interpreted scripture and those that understood that these are metaphorical and allegorical and often that these scriptures took place or they were fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus and during the lifetime of those that came after at the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. I would just conclude today to remind us, and this is just part one of this series, but I just want to remind us that let's not get too caught up in all the negatives. Let's, let's always go back to what we can find in scripture where Paul teaches us in 2 Corinthians 5.18 that we've been reconciled, that God has reconciled us into himself through Christ and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. My job is not to scare the hell out of people. My job is to not go out and like Chicken Little tell everybody the sky is falling, but we are called as his children. Those who have been reconciled are called that we can reconcile uh, others and that we can meet this living uh, God, this God who's the source of all life. We can worship and, and praise him by living life to the fullest. That That's one of the greatest things that we can take away from this. It, of course, is natural that our brains love cortisol and they and love the negative aspects of life. But remember that no matter how bad it gets, no matter how bad you might even feel about yourself, remember you're called of God. You've been reconciled to him in Christ and you can live your life to the fullest. And as God has called you to be you in whatever that you do, be you to the fullest that you can be. We're so thankful that each of you have let us know resources that you're wanting. We're doing our best to get those together in the next few months and get those to you. And I pray that as we go forward that uh, you'll keep in touch with us, tune in each week, and hope that God will bless you each throughout this coming day and throughout the week.